The history of mankind is amazing and unique. How many mysteries and unusual events have happened over the past few thousand years? However, among the many events, there are those that stand out against the background of the rest and which we, the people of the 21st century, find it especially hard to believe. It is about such events that will be discussed in this video of Top F. Get your popcorn ready, we start. 1. The Pontix used underground tactical bears against Roman soldiers. About 71 BC. E. Roman legions under the command of the consul Lucius Lucullus laid siege to the Pontic city of Themyscira. Yes, the very one in which, according to legend, beautiful Amazon warriors lived. The legionnaires, having examined the city and its defenders from afar, did not find muscular beauties, they were expectedly upset and decided to raise the Misera to the ground. However, the assault did not give anything, the walls of the city were strong and high, the defenders fought bravely, and the army made a temporary retreat. The siege began. The Romans were experienced masters of trench warfare. They had engineering troops who specialized in digging. By order of Lucullus, the sappers dug a tunnel under the walls of the Misera so that the soldiers could penetrate the walls. But the Pontians noticed the tunnel and, when the legionnaires launched an offensive, they made holes in the ceiling of the tunnel and dropped several bears into it. Yes, you heard right. Naturally, the Romans were not at all happy with them. The battle of the Romans with fighting animals was described by the ancient author Appian. But he did not mention whether the clubfoot were the standard weapons of the Pontix, or whether they were hastily recruited in a nearby menagerie on a voluntary compulsory basis. One way or another, the bears coped well, you can't immediately take the skin of a large animal with a gladius or a pylum. And as if the tactical bear cavalry was not enough, the inhabitants of the besieged city threw several more beehives into the Roman passages. Well, to add fun and frenzy, as a result, the attack bogged down. After reinforcements came to the besiegers, who had left to defeat the army of King Mithridates VI at the city of Kabir, Themyscira fell and was destroyed. 2. Michelangelo mocked churchmen who criticized his drawings. Michelangelo Buonarroti was a very famous painter and sculptor who gained recognition during his lifetime. Why? He was so cool that Dad personally invited him to paint the Sistine Chapel. The painter enthusiastically took up his favorite thing to paint beautiful naked bodies in the strangest positions. And the pontiff liked it. But among the close associates of the Pope there were those who believed that there are can't be naked people in the Vatican in any way. The shameless one could at least add underpants to them, but, you see, he does not want to. No decency and humility before the Lord. The main opponent of nudity in the chapel was the papal master of ceremonies, Biagio de Cecina, not the last person in the entourage of his holiness. Seeing Michelangelo working on the last judgment fresco, he stated the following. How shameful that in such a sacred place all these naked figures should have been depicted, so shamefully exposing themselves. This fresco is more suitable for public baths and taverns than for a papal chapel. Biagio Martinelli de Cecina, Papal Master of Ceremonies Michelangelo took and silently added Biagio to the fresco. He depicted him in the underworld, surrounded by demons and frightened sinners, in the guise of Minus, an infernal judge with donkey ears. The body of the master of ceremonies was wrapped around a snake, sinking its teeth into his male organ. Biagio began to resent the Pope, what does this painter allow himself? To which the pontiff succinctly replied that he was the vicar of God on earth, and his power does not extend to hell, so the portrait should remain. 
Later, at the Triton Cathedral, the clergy revised their views on nudity in art and decided, no, it's not good to appear in church without pants. By order of the new Pope Pius IV, the artist Daniele de Volterra, a student of Michelangelo, made some changes to the fresco, adding loincloths to everyone. Because of this, he received the nickname Bragaton, Drawer of Pants. In addition, he remade the St. Catherine and Blaise of Sebastia depicted there. 3. Marie Antoinette asked for forgiveness from her executioner. Everyone knows the phrase that the French Queen Marie Antoinette allegedly uttered when she was informed about the starving commoners, if they don't have bread, let them eat cakes. She didn't really say that. But here are her last words recorded accurately. Marie Antoinette was executed by guillotine on October 16, 1793 at exactly 12.15 p.m. When she climbed the scaffold, she accidentally stepped on the executioner's foot and said, Forgive me, Monsignor. I didn't do it on purpose. That's what it means to raise a real lady. 4. The British taught seagulls to defecate on German submarines. Submarines, which began to be widely used during the First World War, completely changed the rules of naval battles. And the most dangerous and technically advanced ships of this type then were German submarines. At the beginning of the war, Germany had only 28 of these submarines. But, despite this, they showed extremely high efficiency in the fight against the British fleet. Submarines attacked suddenly, sank ships right and left, and virtually nothing could be done about them. In 1916, the first weapon against them was invented depth charges. But before the creation of sonars, there were still two decades left. Therefore, German submarines were invisible even to the most advanced warships of the time. They did what they wanted, attacking even neutral and merchant ships without warning. The British, losing ships one after another, decided that it was enough to endure it and began to look for ways to fight. Luckily, without sonar, the submarines were practically blind in combat. All they could do was to detect with the help of periscopes any ship floating carelessly nearby and then launch torpedoes in its direction. Therefore, the German boat could be detected by observation tubes sticking out from under the water. And the British took advantage of it. Teams of British sailors on small boats patrolled their waters. These fighters were armed with the latest anti-submarine systems of their time. When they spotted a periscope, they swam unnoticed, threw a canvas bag over it and smashed the eyepieces with blacksmith hammers. The Germans, announcing the serene depths of the sea with furious abuse, returned to their port for repairs and almost by touch. There is evidence that, for example, the captain of the destroyer HMS Exmouth specifically recruited blacksmiths into the team because they were better at swinging hammers than the average sailors. This tactic also had drawbacks. You still have to notice the periscope, especially if there are even the slightest waves on the sea. Therefore, the British were constantly looking for a way to make enemy submarines more visible. For example, the Royal Admiralty hired a sea lion trainer named Joseph Woodward to teach his pets how to find submarines and scream out their location. However, the program was ineffective, and British Admiral Frederick Samuel Inglefield proposed a new idea. At his direction, a training facility was built in Pool Harbor, which is not the same as Pearl Harbor, where ornithologists purposefully trained seagulls to detect and unmask submarines. Seabirds were fed over dummies of submarines, developing the association a submarine means food in them. It was assumed that flocks of hungry gulls would fly over the submarines, giving away their location. In addition, the feces of the birds were supposed to stain the lenses of the periscopes, worsening the visibility of the Germans. 
Bird training continued for almost a year, but later the project was curtailed as unnecessary. It turned out that it was more efficient to escort merchant ships with destroyers with deep sea bombs than to hope that a stupid seagull would find a submarine and start accurately bombarding its eyepieces with droppings. Since 1917, not a single merchant ship had left the port without a convoy, and attacks by German submarines became much more rare. In addition, British and American reconnaissance aircraft began to patrol the seas. Although they could not destroy submarines, during the entire war only one submarine was sunk by air attack, and their presence they were forced not to raise their periscopes from the water, remaining blind and helpless. 5. Americans developed pigeon-guided bombs. In the States, they love eccentric military projects no less than in Britain. There, too, all the time they thought about how to use various animals and birds in the war. In the 40s of the last century, the United States created many new models of bombs and missiles, but they all had depressingly low accuracy. The military were looking for a way to make the shells controllable, but nothing worked. Electronics had not yet reached the required level. Behavioral psychologist Burr Skinner came to the aid of the valiant American Army. He suggested that the military use not bulky electronic devices, but living beings as an onboard missile control system. According to Skinner's idea, a specially trained tactical war pigeon should direct the projectile to the target. After all, these birds also carried military correspondence, why not take care of delivering bombs to the address? The military thought the idea was a bit silly, but intriguing. Skinner was given the budget and engineers. The contractor was General Mills Incorporated, a manufacturer of food, toys, and bombs. Together, the following design was developed. A special camera with three round screens was installed in front of the projectile, where an image was projected using a system of lenses and mirrors. In front of them sat a dove. When he noticed the silhouette of a target on the screen, he had to peck at it. The mechanism fixed the pressure and directed the ammunition in the right direction. Pigeons were trained by Skinner in what he called operant conditioning. If the trained bird in the simulator pecks exactly at the image, then it is fed with grain, if it is lazy, then it is deprived of the reward. The Delft project was developed from 1940 to 1944. But in the end, he was curtailed, although Skinner said that he was about to turn his birds into professional kamikazes. However, in 1948 the program was resumed under the new code name Orcon, from the English. Organic control, organic management. But all research ceased in 1953, this time for good. By that time, fairly compact electronic control systems had been developed and pigeons were not needed. 6. The winner of the 1904 Olympic Marathon was carried to the finish line in his arms. On August 30th, 1904, in the city of St. Louis, USA, athletics competitions were held, which were simply badly organized. Therefore, the events that happened at the marathon resemble a bad joke. 32 athletes participated in the 40 kilometers marathon, but only 14 reached the finish line. The race was held on a very bad road. It was not blocked for cars, and passing cars kicked up pillars of dust. Several athletes, because of her, were on the verge of death, having received internal bleeding and lung damage. Others passed out due to 32 degrees Celsius heat and dehydration. The first to finish was the American runner Frederick Lors. As it turned out, during the race he became ill, and the coach picked him up in a car. Lorza was taken almost to the finish line, but after recovering, he got out of the car, deciding to take a walk, and suddenly crossed the finish line. 
The athlete immediately began to honor and handed him a medal, but he admitted that the mistake came out. And he was driven away, booed and suspended for six months from the competition. Britton Thomas Hicks came second. This one was already running relatively straight, at least most of the way, so it was declared the real winner. Although Hicks, as runners used to do in those days, was doping. Several coaches fled with him, pouring cognac and rat poison into his mouth along the way. Then it was believed that strychnine has a tonic effect and is generally incredibly useful. By the time Hicks got to the finish line, he was hallucinating and barely able to move, poisoned by alcohol and strychnine. The coaches literally carried him, holding him by the shoulders, and the athlete unconsciously moved his legs in the air, thinking that he was still running. He was immediately taken away in an ambulance and barely pumped out. Also among the finishers was a simple Cuban postman named Felix Carvajal, who joined the marathon at the last second. He raised funds for his participation in the marathon by participating in cash races throughout Cuba. But on the way to the Olympics, Carvajal lost all his cash and dice in New Orleans and was forced to hitchhike to St. Louis. Felix did not even have money for equipment, and he ran in ordinary clothes, a shirt, shoes, and trousers. The latter were shortened by a passing Olympian, a discus thrower, with a pocket knife. And finally, two black students from Africa, Lynn Tonyane and Jan Mashiani, participated in the marathon. The Africans joined the race because they were passing by and noticed the athletes preparing, and decided, why are we worse? Jan came 12th, but Lynn could well take the prize, but two factors prevented him. First, he ran barefoot because he didn't have shoes with him. The second is that an aggressive stray dog followed him halfway, and he was forced to seriously deviate from the route. 7. A piece of Queen Victoria's wedding cake has been kept as a relic for almost 200 years. The happy newlyweds were served a luxurious wedding cake weighing 300 pounds, or about 136 kilograms. This luxurious three-tiered cake was crowned with a miniature bride and groom in Roman dresses and several smaller figurines, their retinue. The figurines were made from refined sugar, a fabulously expensive thing in those days. The cupcake was soaked in a lot of alcohol, and also stuffed with lemon, elderberry, sugar, and dried fruit. But there was a snag. The bride was on a diet. The guests were not hungries in general. No one was eager to eat a cake weighing more than a centner. After the ceremony, Victoria ordered it to be cut into pieces, sealed in tin boxes, and distributed to acquaintances, friends, and just random individuals. You see, the custom of handing out half-eaten pieces to the departing guests on the path existed even at the royal court. But not all of the owners of a piece of such a cake were ready to use it for its intended purpose. This is, after all, a gift from Her Royal Majesty, and you want to eat it. The slices were left as a keepsake, and it so happened that some of them have survived to this day. To this day, Pieces of Victoria's wedding cake are of great value to lovers of antiquities. So, a couple of such slices are kept as a relic in the art collection of the Royal Trust. Another small piece was bought at auction in 2016 for £1,500, $2,000. If you think that's a lot, here's some information for you to compare. In 1998, Sotheby's sold for $29,900 a piece of cake from the 1937 wedding of King Edward VIII and Wallace Simpson. And what is most interesting, due to the high alcohol content, Victoria's cake is still edible. At least theoretically. That's all for today. Mr. Top F was with you. Thanks for watching to the end. Like this video, subscribe to the channel if you haven't already, and turn on notifications to catch all new videos.